Hello friends. It is beyond any doubt that as music affects our mood, so does the language through which we express ourselves affects our thoughts. Our stance in life, and in many ways, our very psychosynthesis. How else? Every language is a conduit of cultural and didactic elements that form its speaker's perspective of our ever-changing world. And as language is reliant on logic, it is also one of the major factors that separate us from the rest of the animal kingdom, that is, brutality. The greater our affinity with the logical dictates of, of the language that we speak, the greater our distance from being brutes, that is, barbarians. The word logic is Greek, and although all languages have borrowed, borrowed this word to refer to the human reasoning process, only Greek uses its root logos, which means speech, and only Greek uses its derivatives lego, legin, as the verb to speak, to say, and more derivatives from logos such as uh, lexis, to refer to a word, hence lexicon, dictionary. And that is not all. If one were to dig even further, he would find out that the word logos initially meant erotic connection, as Eros, according to Hesiod's Theogony, was the primal god that unified the elements of life, the cosmos. So in the beginning, there was the word, the Logos, Eros. And this is so apropos, uh, considering that human speech developed to bring people together, to proliferate. These derivative values within Greek words afford one with the greatest affinity uh, with logic. In that sense, it is he or she who speaks Greek and consciously thinks in Greek that enjoys the greatest distance from the animal kingdom, from brutality, from being a brute, a barbarian. It stands to reason, therefore, that all the modern languages of the world, the ones that are civilized, are laden with Greek diction to express the noblest thoughts and institutions in order to claim membership to the birth child of Hellas, Western civilization. It seems everyone wants to come to Europe. Everyone wants to go to America. Uh, these are the byproducts of Greek civilization. The Greeks must have a word for it. Many a scholar has expostulated whenever he or she has found self in a lexical quandary. And if a whole word is not in immediately available, the absolute values uh, of Greek particles are mobilized to form new words like telephone, stethoscope, generator, or half Greek words and half Latin, like automobile. Consequently, Greek loanwords and Greek made words abound throughout uh, the planet, especially within European languages. However, speakers of modern Greek are privileged, are, are privileged to have more immediate access, as I said, to the semantics of these words. They want to think, that is, because there are many Greeks that speak Greek and take it for granted. Uh, because even in its modern form, the language is the only one in Europe that can boast unbroken continuity and development from the days of Homer and the classical period when it enjoyed its highest eloquence. Having evolved from classical, Hellenistic, medieval, and uh, Byzantine Greek and contemporary uh, Demotic Greek without any schisms during the millennia of its development, 90% uh, of modern Greek vocabulary boasts not only classical descent, uh, with the same ancient particles uh, still providing the inexhaustible source of compounds to form new words, but it has also retained most of the complexity of its inflection, despite the, political, the often political efforts to simplify the language in tandem with our Orwellian times, which thrive in a planet increasingly threatened by simplistic mass media English. And complexity is a good thing. Uh, it might not be immediately practical, but in the long run, it's a very good investment. 
because com complex language produces complex thought. As things stand to this day, Hellenophones not only have functional exclusivity to the particles and derivatives that give meaning to all the words Greeks have lent to the world, but, but are also the only ones who have non-dictionary access to the life lessons these words can bequeath to humanity. It seems that as far back as 2,500 years ago, Athenian philosopher Antisthenes knew this and advocated that the principles of wisdom are to be found within the study of words. He, liter he literally said, Archi Sophias iton onomaton episcepsis. Of course, he meant Greek words, since all other languages of less developed peoples reach the Greek ear as bar, bar, bar. Hence, Aristotle's labeling all non-Greek speakers as barbarians. The latter, barbarians, rang so offensively true that ever since, beginning with the Romans, who boasted a Greek teacher in every wealthy home, Western intelligentsia have thrown themselves into the erudite study of Greek, seeking linguistic prestige by proxy to this language and its classical culture. There is no better exemplification of this obsession of the Westerners than the one found in a 2002 publication that I chanced upon by British linguist David Crystal, uh, entitled, quote, English as a Classical Language, unquote, in which he attempts to affiliate English to Greek and Latin, especially Greek, due to the large percentage of English diction stemming from these two classical sources. What is rather unfortunate, though, is that in his article, Mr. Crystal declares the Greek language as not living, but living dead. His inference is that although Greek is dead, according to him, its living part is attributed to the numerous Greek words functioning within English, which he whimsically considers to be as classical as the language of Pericles. In seeking linguist linguistic uh, prestige by proxy, non-Greek linguists like Mr. Crystal choose to overlook the fact that these Greek words function multifacetedly only in modern Greek, whereas in English they are as distanced from their semantic applications as the Elgin marbles are distanced from the pediments of the Acropolis and borrowed as such permanently. It is certainly true that if Greek and Latin were to be extracted from English, as from any other European tongue for that matter, the latter would revert to the semi-barbarity of a Bronze Age and people would not even be able to say telephone today. Nonetheless, just as however many words a language like Tahitian may borrow from English per se, it would still be considered Tahitian Creole, at best, and not English. So in the case of classical vocabulary entering English produces no classical language, but Creolization. Uh, intellectuals C and, and professors C. Bailey and K. Marold have attested to English being a Creole language that is a mongrel-made language for practical purposes quite convincingly in the Cambridge History of English, as have many a serious scholar that is honest enough to bear no linguistic chip on his or her shoulders. That which easily debunks the absurd claim that English is a classical language due to its imported vocabulary from Greek and Latin is the inability of this borrowed diction to function outside its stilted context. The mere fact that an Anglophone requires dictionary reference to access the roots of borrowed words like uh, anthropomorphic, lexicon, or even school, for instance, marks them as foreign to English. And this is so simply because in English one cannot say anthropos to mean human, morphe to say form, lexis to mean word, scholi to mean leisure, or scholasa to say I am off work, to make the social linguistic connection that to the Greek mindset, even today, learning is a leisure time activity, hence the word school. Whilst a speaker of English makes use of the Greek compound economy to refer to the financial state of a country and the verb economize to mean to save money, he cannot say ecos to mean home as in ecosystem 
and nomi to say distribution, the anemo, or share, in order to understand the words didactics, which are none other than reference to the proper dispensation of the assets of one's property for its practical maintenance. Lacking the derivatives of the Greek verb nemo, nemin, which means distribute, as I said, in the compound of economy, still abounding in modern Greek deriv derivatives, an English speaker would be hard-pressed to make its semantic connection with the goddess Nemesis, who distributes justice upon anyone who causes imbalances in the order of things within the broader ecos, even if the English say, he is my nemesis, my punisher. An American athlete can go to the gym or practice gymnastics, but he cannot say gymnos, gymnos, to say naked, or apogymnono, to say strip bare, or gymnazome, to mean to exercise in one's birthday suit. Uh, for his forefathers never exercised in the nude or competed naked in the original Olympics in order for the word to be disseminated throughout the modern language. President Trump can speak of patriotism and patriots, but can never say patris or patrida to mean the country that inspires patriotism in him. Nor does his language bear the gender inflection to use the feminine case to express the duality of father and the feminine to refer to his birthland as Greek does, the father and mother combination of one's homeland. He can praise democratic values but cannot say from demokratia, but he cannot say krato to mean hold, as the Greek does today, or demos to refer to uh, the population of a city. A speaker of English can stress the importance of hygiene, but cannot say hygia to say health, uh, or to greet someone with its shortened derivative of yasu that we say today. Yasu comes from hygia su which means high in Greek and is the most often used health wish word amongst Greeks. It is social linguistically interesting to note that instead of saying nice shoes to a friend who has just bought a pair of shoes, a Greek wishes me yia, shortened as me ya, which in English would translate may you wear them with yia, health. It is this multiple derivative structure of both ancient and modern Greek as a continuant of ancient, often augmented with divine personification, uh, such as that of the goddess Hygieia, for instance, as I said with Nemesis earlier, that charges words with their incomparable semantic punch and clarifies things for its more intelligent speakers like no other language in the world. And I stress for its more intelligent speakers because not all Greeks delve in uh, this sort of thinking. But the language is there. If Sigmund Freud lamented the modern West as a doomed organism whose heart never really learned to beat, it is so because it never developed cultural linguistically to produce any counterparts of the original Greek diction it indirectly and directly lies, uh, relies on. A case in point is the notion of eros, as I said, logos, eros, whose derivatives in Greek to this day produce words that allude to stimulation and activity, like to say, fall in love in Greek, erotevome. He can say eroto, to ask, thereby stimulating one to answer. So even when you ask a question, we have the word eros within. Erotesis, question. Um, Ergon project, which is a uh, derivative of stimulation, a result of activity. Ergazome, I work. Erethizo, to stimulate. Erythron, red, the most stimulating of colors. And countless other derivatives. In Greek, the most vibrant of consonants, the liquid vo voiced uh, alveolar, approximate R, rr, in prefixes like er and or, as in, excuse my French, orgasm, orgiastic, organ, etc. Obviously, functions, uh, function onomatopoetically and contribute semantically to express palpitation, excitement, and life itself. There's no more excited, there's, uh, there's, 
another no other exciting uh, consonant than R as rolled rrr, in the human palate. Uh, this gives credit, of course, to Hesiod's Theogony, in which Eros, as I said, is the primal god of creation. Even the Greek word freedom for freedom, eleftheria, is compounded by the verb elephthin, to come, as we say ella today in Greek, and ero, to passionately love, which sums up freedom in a meaning-packed word whose compounded morphology literally states that freedom is none other than one's ability to come or go to where his or her passions lie. By comparison, its English counterpart, being etymologically unattested, hardly suffices to define what freedom really is. This Greek notion of freedom, eleftheria, may very well account for the country's turbulent political life and its volatile governments. For Greeks have always been one of the most difficult people to govern as the individualists that we are. In fact, the very word govern is of Greek origin and has entered English corruptedly through Latin. In Greek, it is pronounced as kiverno. In ancient Greek, it was pronounced like kiverno, hence govern. This has been further corrupted in English as cyber, as in cyberspace, cyberstore, etc. Although for uh, some reason, etymological dictionaries make no reference to its deep root, uh, the Greek word kivos, uh, which has produced the English cube, is obvious in the Greek word for government, kivernisis. The idea may very well be that one can govern people by packing them up in the cubes of a matrix, uh, so to say. Uh, boxing people up in laws or ideologies controls their freedoms in a way that they can be more manageably governed. This may be very well be a paratymological uh, interpretation on my part, but the cube as a root in the original form of the Greek word that produced government is evident to a speaker of Greek, as the word kivi also meant dice, and there are references of Zeus controlling the dice, the fates of people's lives. So government has definitely something to do with cubes. So whether one interprets the cube to be the box in which people are put in so that they may be controlled, or to be the cube-like structure of a chariot frame or a ship's bridge from which the charioteer or captain respectively control things, it is there to stimulate thought beyond the simplistic sound notion cue it produces in English when one says government. Greek diction often gets so mangled and disfigured by the time it reaches uh, English, that the sound and morphology of these words have the same intellectual stimulation on its users as, hey, Butch, come here, has on a dog, nil. A case in point is the word alms, as, such as to give alms, which means in English to show mercy and give relief to the poor. The king gave alms to the poor. Originally pronounced in Greek, eleimosini, Eleimosini, six full syllables, uh, from the root eleo, which means to do one a favor. Uh, it was vulgarized in Latin as alemosina, chewed up through Proto-Germanic as uh, alemosna, and ended up without any etymological limbs as alms in English, from eleimosini to alms. The original form is still expostulated by the Greeks when they say eleos, spare me, meaning spare me, as I would say spare us Mr. Crystal with your claims of a classical English tongue when you cannot say eleimosini but resort to alms. Even when Greek words do survive morphologically, their English spelling visually strips them of their roots, so one would have to consult dictionaries to get to those roots. The rendering of the Greek Y, which is like the U in English, or sometimes used as a Y, either as U or as Y, for instance, exacerbates the confusion even further in words of Greek origin filtered through Latin. This is most evident in the word hybrid that we use today, which came to English through Latin hybrida, meaning mongrel, and was initially used to refer to the crossbreeding between a sow and a wild boar, a pig and a wild pig or that between a free man and a black slave in those days, hence the word mulatto and mule. One acquainted with Greek 
easily discerns the word ivris, which produced the English word hubris, meaning overwhelming pride, punishable by the gods. And the suffix id, and as in hybrid, from the Greek idion, which refers to origin, and is rendered as id in English in words like asteroid, mongoloid, caucasoid, etc. Obviously, crossbreeding against the laws of nature or even those of society was frowned upon in the past, just as hybridic crops are today shunned by naturalists as a threat to nature and our healthy food chain. The fact that hybrids like the mule, which is a cross between a donkey and a horse, are infertile, sterile, further asserts the divine punishment theory that hubris is punishable by the gods. True to its original meaning of defiance, to this day, modern Greeks use the word ivrizo, kathivrisis, uh, uh, to mean swear, to lash at someone with profanity, putting oneself in a superior position to use profanity against somebody else. Understanding such roots, friends, is paramount to applying the logic that these words dictate. For instance, if a society can make the linguistic and mythological connection between hybrid and hubris, it might be able to avert the mass media promotion of unnatural concoctions uh, like multiracial and multicultural societies that cannot breathe as of late in the absence of a common ethos that could produce a healthy ethnos. Ethos? Ethnos. Hence the word ethnic. Devoid of a common ethos, morality, which is characteristic of our Creole cultures and Creole languages, the only ethnic, id est, national coagulant, cohesion, is the common materialistic obsession that breeds idiots, who at every interracial conflict or outburst loot department stores for smartphones and sports shoes. Interestingly enough, the word idiot stems from the Greek word uh, or root, idios, meaning self. Where there is no cultural unity under the linguistic dictates of a philosophical language like Greek, uh, people do not connect outside the withdrawal of self, idios. They become idiotias, Greek for private people, who keep to themselves. The words, as I said, are still used in the derivative forms in Greek. This is so evident in the ever escalating crime rate in the USA, where occasionally even children, you know, preliminary school age children, randomly uh, burst into their classrooms and shoot their classmates. And this is why the term, he, has, he was such a polite and quiet little boy or person, is common testimony of character witnesses <clears throat> on the part of the defense to alleviate the image of one accused of such atrocities. During my linguistic studies in the States, I briefly attended a New Testament Greek course before challenging it when I realized that I knew better Greek than most people there were teaching it and was surprised that the uh, difficulty students were facing, struggling to understand the Greek phrase theos erotas, which means divine love. The perplexion was attributed to the fact that the students had been taught that eros was strictly sexual erotic love and agape familial love. Lacking such distinctions in English in which one can both be a lover of a person or an animal lover, the students obviously could not reconcile sex with the divine. When I explained to them that in Greek uh, the word eros also functioned beyond a strictly sexual content context to mean any strong passion of attraction, uh, that leads to unification in the way an English speaker may say, I am enamored with your mother's cooking. I received inquisitive stares. In fact, one student wondered uh, how I knew a dead language so well until the professor came to my rescue, revealing to the class that Greek was not dead amongst the Greeks uh, in the way that Latin is to Italians, and that a Greek schoolboy can understand uh, the Greek of 2,000 year, uh, years ago that an English person could understand 600-year-old Chaucer. The false idea that ancient Greek is dead, uh, a dead language to modern Greek, seems to have permeated many institutions that teach it in the West. For instance, the other day I chanced upon a New York insurance advertisement, you can access this in YouTube to cross-reference what I'm saying, 
which began with the phrase, the ancient Greeks had four words for love. On hearing the past tense of had, I expected a revelation, a revelation, an apocalypse of antiquated words that I was not familiar with. So one can imagine my bewilderment and surprise when I heard the words that every Greek is still brought up with, that is, agape, familial, uninterested love, eros, passionate love, as we said, philia, love that grows out of friendship, and storgi, love that bestows affection and empathy. Of course, there's another love, philotimo, that could not be explained in English, so they omitted that in the advertisement. However, when I tried to access the comment section of this YouTube entry, I found it blocked. Uh, I presume probably because thousands of Greeks had viciously protested against the usage of the past tense of had, referring to words that were still alive and kicking amongst the contemporary Greeks. There have been quite a few instances like this, when, as Greeks, despite our modern-day shortcomings and our political chaos here, in our uh, crisis situations, overshadowed by the ephemeral golden age of our forefathers, who suffered the same uh, plights as we do today, but they show, really shown uh, for a period of time, we have been in intentionally shortchanged for our retention of our linguistic identity over the millennia. In fact, many Westerners have produced volumes in an effort to prove that we are far cries from the glorious ancients. In fact, I can think of no other modern ethnic group that has received such advertent discreditation regarding its affinity with its glorious past. Uh, Friedrich uh, Nietzsche himself took notice of this. In chapter 15, uh, in his work entitled The Birth of Tragedy, he is quoted as saying, quote, Almost every age and cultural stage has at some time or another sought in an ill-tempered frame of mind to free itself to get rid of the Greeks. Because in comparison with the Greeks, all their achievements, of the Europeans, apparently fully original and admired in all sincerity, suddenly appeared to lose their color and life and were reduced to unsuccessful copies, even caricatures. And so, a heartfelt inner anger constantly kept breaking out against that arrogant little Greek nation which dared throughout time to define everything that was not produced in its own country as barbaric. He continues by saying, Unfortunately, people were not lucky enough to find the cup of hemlock which could do away with, with these Greeks. For all the poisons they created, envy, slander, and inner anger were insufficient to destroy that self-satisfied magnificence, which many of you can probably see in my face. Hence, confronted by the Greeks, people have always been ashamed and afraid. It seems that an individual who values the truth above everything else might dare to propose as true the notion that the Greeks drive the chariot of our civilization and every other civilization, but that almost always the wagon and the horses are inferior material and cannot match the glory of their charioteers, who amuse themselves being able to whip such a team into the abyss over which they bound with the grace of Achilles. Such an individual who values the truth, there are many, but such an individual that I've come across is the academic Spanish linguist Francisco Adrados, who stated that all languages are essentially crypto-Hellenic, crypto-Greek, as they have borrowed so many words from the original Greek source, like crypto, which means uh, hide, and whether it suits some or not, the fact remains that only modern Greek is obviously Hellenic, being the only language whose speakers can say kryptome or krivome to mean I'm hiding, or krypsona to mean hiding place in scores of its uh, derivatives. And therefore, it is not a language in a crypt the way some uh, linguists would have it in barbaric climes. Considering all this, the obvious conclusion to be drawn is that Greek is the only modern language deservant to be referred to as a classical language, privileged with incomparable advantages over other European uh, languages that heavily rely on Greek diction to communicate beyond barbarism, as I said. And this is so because only one acquainted with Greek, as I said, fully knows what he is talking about when he uses this diction as long as he's a thinker. For Greek words are not just sound notion cues that even animals can respond to, 
but universities of didactic and philosophical thought. In closing, I would like to remind you of the grotesque figure of Mr. Portogalos in the American film comedy, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. This Mr. Portogalos, although a comical figure, did have a point in looking for Greek roots in so many English words after all, considering what I've said, and you can cross-reference everything I've said. These words permeate every facet of high communication throughout the world. Greece may be phenomenally small in size and flanked by not-so-friendly nations which still border on barbarism, but both culturally and linguistically, it seems to have acted in our world like the pinhead from which the Big Bang created the universe. Maybe this is what prompted Henry James Maine to say in his Cambridge speech, except for the blind forces of nature, nothing in this world moves that is not Greek in its origin. Thank you for listening, people.